Let's begin. We begin to resolve the United States federal government ought to pay reparations to African Americans. We observe that as Gary Stein writes in the Sun Sentinel, our country is on the track toward racial justice in the status quo. Recent policy changes, such as the action plan to reduce racial and ethnic health disparities and the expansion of the Fair Housing Act of 2015, are clear examples of this trend in action. If reparations disrupt this trend toward racial equality, the common ballot is in order. Contention 1, reparations incite public backlash. Passing reparations would undoubtedly anger the majority of Americans, 68% according to a YouGov poll, who are opposed to reparations. But even worse, according to Alfred Brophy of DePaul University, most non-blacks will view reparations as a radical redistribution of wealth, which angers them even more. For example, Gabriel Schoenfield of the Hunsett Institute explains that reparations to Israel have unleashed, quote, a tide of anti-Semitic hate unseen since before World War II, complete with hate mail, death threats, and physical harassment on the streets. Furthermore, as NICAN of the University of Michigan finds, when people's beliefs are contradicted, those beliefs become entrenched. We've seen this in the real world. The Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs reports that reparations to Israel only perpetuated and further racist stereotypes, turning the public against Jews. Ultimately, when opponents of reparations are angered, they strengthen their opposition to further racial reform. That matters because politicians must appease their electorate to stay in office. Thus, politicians will stop supporting progressive policy in an attempt to keep their jobs. Intention two, the media will entrench racism in our society. As Ben Jake of the University of Amsterdam explains, the media in today's world does not passively report on events. Rather, it reconstructs them with a, quote, special focus on negative, conflictual, or dramatic events, and generally a white, Western, male, and middle class perspective on news events. As such, the media's depiction of reparations would cater to the opinions held by 94% which you got by as part of complete opposition. The media thus spreads disdain throughout our society. A fantastic example is the civil unrest in Baltimore in April this year. The American Journalism Review explains that the media focused on the destruction of property instead of the peaceful protests, undermining the legitimacy of the protesters. This decreases future policy for two reasons. First, public response. Gilliam of Columbia explains that Americans get their information from the media. If the media is anti-racial justice, the people will be too, and they'll vote against politicians that seek to implement progressive reform. Second, the media, the media kills social movements. The Organization of Civil Rights Movement Veterans finds that the media's focus on violent, dramatic, and conflictual events, quote, diminishes the perceived effectiveness of nonviolent political action. This undermines the prominence of collective political action. Zomerin of Duke University empirically confirms in a meta-analysis of 182 studies that is per the perceived effectiveness of collective political action falls, so too does participation in collective action. The impact is substantial, as Anthony Chen of the University of Michigan finds that a decrease in participation in collective action substantially decreases the likelihood that progressive policies will pass. Contention 3, reparations work the perception of progressive programs. On the ground of Wake Forest University, explains that when a policy like reparations is justified on the basis of race, the public turns against further progressive reform. This is because the issues addressed by that policy become conflated with the issue of race in the eyes of both the public and the legislature, and policies of that type become viewed as racial handouts, which incites tension. Brown cites the example of Georgia, where race-based reform created intense racial tensions. This made the political climate hostile and not conducive to progress. Brown qualifies the impact of this effect, finding that racial justifications for policies A, make further reform more difficult to pass, and B, give politicians the opportunity to capitalize on racial tension and pass punitive policies that entrench racism in our society and government. At the end of the day, reparations prevent us from continuing to pass the policies that truly bring America towards equality, and that's why you should make it. Contention 
one is ending injustice. Guarantees of non-repetition are necessary parts of reparations, as Professor Theo von Goven, von Goven writes, that reparations render justice by preventing and deterring violations alongside guarantees of non-repetition. In the context of reparations for African Americans, this means that according to Lee Harris of SULR, a true reparative remedy for African Americans must attempt to eliminate racism. To do so would involve the end of current discriminatory policies that effectively perpetuate the same divide established by past injustices such as slavery and segregation. Graham Boyd of the ACLU writes that the war on drugs offers seamless continuity with the most shameful episodes of our past. Slaves were bound in plantations from which they could not escape, and now it is prisons that deprive African Americans of their freedom. Steve Rowe count the cost further that despite the similarity in levels of drug use between blacks and whites, black people in the U.S. are ten times more likely to be imprisoned for a drug offense. Jamel Bowie's Slate Magazine thus concludes that reparations would include an end to the war on drugs, an end to mass incarceration, and a reduction in racial profiling. Ending mass incarceration is crucial to combating racial biases, as mass incarceration policies feed back into the biases that created them in the first place. As Gary Young from The Guardian explains, mass incarceration perpetuates routine criminalization of African Americans as a people. The biases perpetuated by mass incarceration policies are so serious that VAR editor Margaret Kimberly argues that mass incarceration affects every aspect of black life, and so great is the weight that imprisonment imposes on black America that every single negative statistic is tied back to the the phenomenon. Contention to is collective action. Paying reparations would bolster modern civil rights advocacy in two ways, and the first is freeing political resources. Paying reparations would allow civil rights advocacy to refocus itself on its broader goals and extend its political resources on other areas instead of using them to try to pass reparations. This has been proven empirically. As Eric Yamamoto of the Boston Law Review finds, for example, that following the payment of Japanese American reparations, Asian American groups joined with the NAACP and other minority groups to push for the Civil Rights Acts of 1990 and 91. Second is increasing efficacy. Martha Biondi writes that the primary action in the United States has been led by a grassroots reparations movement that has developed the urge for action. Alfredo Robinson of GW further said African American reparations have emerged as one of the predominant civil rights issues of the new millennium. Thus, reparations will increase the perception of efficacy of the modern civil rights movement, which is critical in building that movement. This is because victims of serious discrimination are often unlikely to join social movements because they can't afford to waste their time. Increasing perceptions of efficacy through a major policy victory like the passage of reparations helps convince the marginalized that it is worth it. Leon Putty of the Oxford Handbook of Political Psychology confirms that feelings of efficacy and collective action especially engage a slow space with closed political opportunities. Thus, Russell Spears of Cardiff University finds that meta-analysis of 182 studies that social movement efficacy is responsible for a proportional increase in collective action by 40%. The University of Chicago argues that without mobilization, the battle to end discrimination is unlikely to take major strides, and historically social movements have been an incredibly effective way in passing policy. For example, even after controlling for public opinion, the University of Michigan finds that when civil rights groups were pushing for fair housing legislation, a one standard deviation increase in civil rights mobilization made it almost three times more likely that legislation would pass. But this is just a piece of the puzzle. When the civil rights movement gains support, more anti-discriminatory policies are passed, and motivating reform is critical. As Quebec's Department of Immigration and Community Culture explains, with no policy or government support, problem situations denigrate and transform into social crises. And in the long term, these crises threaten the social peace and impede development of the United States. For these reasons, we urge them to the ballot.
in Preston, it's always paid to one specific group. But second, let's go over a quick overview. What we tell you in our case is that racial reform is happening. It's not huge national news, but we're passing things like the Fair Sentencing Act, the Fair Housing Act. The thing is, these don't have the huge backlash that reparations do because A, they're targeted at all minorities, not just one, and B, they don't cost a ton of money like reparations do. But let's go over their case. First, like, they say, so they can't just end the war on drugs and say that's a reparation, that's just not how it works. But they say we guarantee non-repetition, right? First, how do you guarantee non-repetition? They don't tell you. And second, if we give reparations, like, guaranteeing non-repetition doesn't mean the war on drugs disappears. So you still have the war on drugs if you vote Trump. But third, the pragmatic reform we're talking about, things like the Fair Sentencing Act, it's not huge national news, but slowly through society we're creating an equal society, and you don't have to, like, blow it all up through reparations to create an equal society. Let's go on to their second intention. In their first part, they talk about exploiting resources. A few problems with this. The first one is people at the NAACP are not even using that many resources on reparations. The NAACP like, currently encourages like, voting, climate change, education, media diversity. It's not wasting that much on this kind of issue. But second, the fact is that they have evidence like, that they tell you from you know, Japanese American groups running the NAACP. It's like one example from the 90s. It's not showing a trend. But third, the fact is that reparations actually dwindle political capital. You can look to Blanks of Rare Magazine, who explained that reparations make the government think that its job is done, making it not pass more policies that benefit minorities in the future. But let's go on to your second part about efficacy. There are a lot of, a lot of problems with this. The first one is that the media actually prevents progressive movements from arising. We give you this in case. The Organization of Civil Rights Movement Veterans, who explains that the mass media defines what is important, and one of the effects of their intense focus on rage and riots is essentially that there's, quote, a diminish in the perceived effectiveness of nonviolent political action. We turn this straight against them because the media is showing violent action. We give you the example of that in our case about the Baltimore riots, which is from today and very, very relevant. The second response is that social media movements that arise will actually be harmful. As Marshall Gans of Harvard explains, since the 1970s, conservatives have developed vast social movements, whereas progressives have not. He continues that, quote, the right has monopolized public uh, moral discourse and can count on the participation of a highly motivated grassroots. The fact is, if grassroots organize, the result will be it will be conser uh, conservative grassroots, not progressive grassroots. But third, reparations will be, uh, will be passed the way the government likes, not the way that the people want it passed. According to From of the Atlantic, when the government spends money on complex programs, the government, not the people who want the program, ends up passing the way the government likes. He continues empirically, this has been the most true when you look to the black poor. The fact is, it won't spur political action because the government will pass it the way the government wants it to, and that won't be a beneficial way for African Americans in the long term. But move on from that. The fourth response is that social movements are irrelevant if the government becomes complacent. Remember the blank evidence we review. That if the government thinks its job is done, it will stop pushing for reform. You won't have social movements that are relevant because the government is complacent. But fifth, turn this against them because coalitions that create collective action are going to break apart. We can look to Hall of St. Mary's, who explains that reparations divide minorities along racial lines, precluding the formation of coalitions and decreasing progressive political action. But sixth, the spear Zomerin evidence, right? We call it Zomerin, they call it spears. The fact is, there's a few issues with it. They essentially say that there's going to be more um, you know, collective action than that kind of thing. The thing is, the, the evidence is talking about civil rights movements, but it's not relevant to reparations for two reasons that I, I, that I outlined earlier. The first is reparations only go to African Americans, so you see responses from other minorities that you don't see in the Spears evidence. But second, um, the, reparations cost a ton of money. There's going to be more backlash than occurred in the Spears evidence, because that's just talking about civil rights movements, whereas reparations create a ton more backlash because whites don't want to give up their money. But finally, on the Chen evidence, they're going to stress over and over that it, like, quote unquote, controls for public opinion. The issue is, it's talking about the 1960s. Public opinion in the 1960s was far, far different than public opinion today. Public opinion today is going to be so much worse. And there are trend evidence that's only talking about like some housing act in the 1960s is not relevant at all to the huge, huge backlash that's going to happen in today's world. Your time. Okay, I'll take that. Let's start off by a point of framework. They tell you that racial progress is happening in this guy's quote. 
But if the media is racist, as they tell you in their second contention, clearly our society has a problem. They tell you that the media is racist and leads to bad policy, then how are they going to get any kind of good policy? They say that their progress is slower and gradual. That doesn't make any sense. If, if the media is bad, then the media is still bad. But even if you don't buy that, and you do believe that we are making genuine progress in the status quo, that's not a reason to negate. Because what Quebec's Department of Immigration explains is that we can't rely on like, trends of goodwill in people and institutions to protect the rights of minorities in the long term. We need to do the most we can to ensure a better political atmosphere for minorities in the long term. Whoever generates more political reform in the long term is going to win today's round. We do that through collective action. And we do that through other terms that I'm about to read in this case. Let's go to their first contention where they talk about that. A lot of logical problems here. First, their analysis is really flawed. They say 68% of people are against reparations, so that means there are a lot of people angry get, if reparations get paid. But just because somebody doesn't support reparations doesn't mean they would suddenly lash out against black people. Anybody who would already do so was probably pretty racist in the first place and unlikely to support anti-discriminatory policy. They give you the example of Schoenfeld and the Holocaust. The problem is, the Schoenfeld example is the typical example of correlation without causation. He says post-reparations, we've seen anti-Semitic hate threats go up, but we've also seen that right because of the Palestinian an Israeli conflict, which drives people against Israel. That's not a, that's not a causation. That's pure correlation. What's not a correlation is what Yamamoto tells you happened to the Japanese reparations movement after after they paid reparations, which was that those movements were emboldened and empowered to fight for new civil rights acts and for new policy. They say this isn't a trend, but that this is the only clear example in the round that actually happened in the United States. You prefer that against all else, but two reasons. Even if you buy that class, that you're going to go for us off of it. First, when backlash happens, that just convinces civil rights activists and others even further that they need to do more to combat racism in society. That's why Kenneth Andrews of Harvard explains that resistance only increases civil rights mobilization. But secondly, political interest groups such as the NAACP can actually use backlash against the, like, the people who are committing backlash. Because when they see bad policy on the horizon, they warn their support supporters, which generates more financial support for them. Overall, Joanne Miller of University of, of Minnesota finds that 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 leads to more mobilization. At the end of the day, the good guys always win. They're looking into our second contention themselves. But then they talk about media. A couple problems here. First, this problem exists in the status quo. It's the definition of non-unique. In fact, we would contend that an affirmative world is better because the government would be challenging the racist narrative that the media is perpetuating. Charles Ogletree of Harvard tells you that paying reparations is a prerequisite to moving forward because we need to raise historical consciousness. They, then they link to like less policy outcomes through Julian. But if this were really true, then the policy outcomes they talk about at the top of their uh, at the top of their case wouldn't be happening because the media would be preventing them. And then their second impact is that the, there's a diminish in the perceived eff effectiveness of social movements. This is really problematic. Their work for this is that essentially the media focuses on violent movements. The problem is that's what's happening in the status quo. But when reparations are paid, that would be a nationwide event that the media would have to cover, and the reparations movement is completely not. Nonviolent. You can turn this entire argument against them because in an affirmative world, we refocus attention onto a group that is completely nonviolent, that increases the effectiveness of nonviolent action and links directly into our case. We win this argument. Let's go into their third position where they talk about like the we're, we're conflating issues with race. First of all, reparations wouldn't racialize any other policy because they are not a policy. They are straight compensation, right? That's that's what they get wrong in their own, in our in their also in a response to our second contention where they say, oh, they wouldn't be designed in a way that helps African Americans. They're not supposed to. They're just supposed to be acknowledgement of a wrongdoing. But even if you don't buy that, this is completely not unique because any impact that has a disparate any policy that has a disparate impact on race is already racialized in the status quo, like welfare and criminal justice reform. They don't show the extent to which that's increasing. Overall, Thomas McCarthy of Northwestern finds that we'd be creating a national conversation on race by paying reparations, which would generate the political will to, for new reform.
explain why. Yeah. It's because of the warrants that we completely missed, which is that the war on drugs represents a seamless continuity in the past. It's very, very similar to the past. Pass, pass any reparations program on drugs by that. Basically, yeah. Because we pass reparations, right? And with that reparations comes the guaranteed non repetition. For example, if I were to pay a thousand bucks to every African American, the war on drugs would not be Have we interned anyone since we paid that? No, we also didn't have World War II. Can I ask you? No, we had the, the war in Iraq, right? Why didn't we intern Iraqi American citizens? I don't know, but we also didn't. I know why. It's because of the guarantee of non competition. That's not why. It's just because America moved forward since then. Do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. Okay, so is the media racist in the status quo? Yes or no? Um, I'd say that when big actions occur, when there's like a big uh, you know, thing that happens, the media will respond violently. Wait, so they're only racist when big things happen? I'd say, I say that they could respond like a little bit to something that is, you know, like low, something like the Fair Housing Act, right? How is that from 20 to 2010, right? Yeah. The media response isn't going to be huge because this is the type of reform well, that goes under the like, under cover. But the this. media response to something like reparations is going to be huge. Right? That's a radical okay. distribution of money. Actually, that's not true. Like, because we have to look more closely at the laws. Right. Sure. Let's, let's look at what actually happens. How is the media racist? By, like, by reporting racism? How? I don't know. By, like, oh, by taking the white stance on things? Like, you look to the Baltimore riot, very, very clear. They were supposed to be, like, non-violent. In fact, most of them were non violent But they focused yeah. on the negative here's, portions of it, disproportionately harming after marriage. Here's the way, here's the way the media is racist, right? So Joseph Rose, the University of Georgia, tells you the way the media is racist is by, yeah, yeah. no, but, like, I'm just thinking, so <laughs> yeah. it's right. He tells you essentially the media is racist because they don't talk about racism. No, that's not what we're saying. <laughs> they, they negatively slant coverage against African Americans without ever actually knowing. No, that's not what our evidence is telling you. You can look to the polls. No, your evidence is says, really, really clear. It's not necessarily yeah. that they focus on violence, but that they focus on the negative portions okay. of it. So, A, so what, that will create violence, okay. and B, they focus on the negative portions of the your, policy that you're after. Yeah, America. hold on. Your contention is entirely, like, your, your evidence is entirely predicated on your violence. And no, so you it's not. Violence, violence. violence is a really clear example of when the media takes the white stance instead of the black stance, which is what happens time and time again. But B, we say so that violence is somebody. going to happen in terms so of So don't we need somebody, somebody, to stand up for the black stance? We're telling you that in the status quo, there is slow reform happening. It's not perfect. Slow I reform. Agree. I agree it's not perfect. Right. So slow reform is going to stop people from getting shot on the streets? It's not perfect. But I'm telling you, if we pass reparations, it will happen. Like, let's give an example, right? I'm saying that if something, so. if something like reparations were passed in 2008, I'm saying the media response and the people's response would be so big that something like Obamacare would not have what I think, And those are the types okay. of policies that we don't okay. want to allow not to pass. Okay. We need things that they may go under first first all, but they're really important. First in of all, you give us no examples of where these people are. They tell you that it's straight compensation, but the 
fact of the matter is that straight compensation could be designed in a way that the, that people aren't interested in, or or even more so, it's not designed with the wrong the non repetition that they talk about because that doesn't cater to government interest. The tailoring of the policy doesn't fit the civil rights group. There's no increase in perceived efficacy. But then the third turn and the biggest reason you negate in today's round is off of the media. Bear this in mind because the Organization for Civil Rights Veterans tells you that when you have these big protests, the media is going to slant coverage against them and decrease, quote, the perceived effectiveness of civil rights groups. We link into all of their effectiveness and turn the argument against them. Let's go on to why we're running the media. His first response tells you that, like, the status quo, the media is racist. Sure, but Stein tells you that there's gradual reform over time, so the white narrative that the media is portraying in the status quo is gradually improving. However, when you vote app, the white narrative really, really gets bad because they respond to Brophy and Nyhan, who tells you that the white narrative becomes backlash, and Van Jake, who they also don't respond to, tells you that that narrative gets perpetuated. And here's the thing when the media focuses on the backlash and the negative side of whatever protest is happening, however non violent it may be, Remember the, the organization of civil rights movement veterans who say, quote, you diminish the perceived effectiveness of collective action, less collective action, less policy, we win the round. All right. And I see the ants. Say that reform is passing in the status quo, they completely drop the response that Harrison puts on in rebuttal, which says that you cannot rely on the goodwill of people in the future in terms of reform. Now it's going to where they want you to vote for them, which is backlash in the media. One key turn that they drop in rebuttal comes from Andrews, who says that when there's backlash against social movements, all that does is that makes social movements fight even harder. Remember, Martin Luther King had people waiting to kill him off of the Freedom Riders buses. That didn't stop him from fighting, that just made him go even harder. But furthermore, remember, in the media, they never respond to the turn that Harrison says, which is that reparations aren't violent. Their entire word for why the media is bad for social movements is because they're looking at violent protests. But the reparations movement isn't violent. If anything, it refocuses. But a more important turn that's really critical is that the media is racist in the status quo. They can see this. They don't tell you how much more racist the media gets, but what we tell you is that you create a counter-narrative, which is critical, because someone has to challenge the media's narrative in the status quo if we're ever going to take a step forward. And that's why McCarthy says that if you pay reparations, it's a prerequisite to moving forward as a country. Now let's go on to why we win the round. The first word, which is on the second contention, which is off of political capital, they really mishandled it. And the big reason why is, be, well, first of all, he says that the NAACP isn't using political capital on reparations. There are a lot of other groups. The Japanese example is the best one. After they passed reparations, their voices got even louder, and they passed the Civil Rights Act of 1990 and 91. Next, on efficacy, really important. He says that so like counter movements will arise, but look at his evidence about conservatism. All that it says is that conservative movements are happening in the status quo and have been happening since the 60s. What we tell you is that the reparations movement is part of the larger civil rights movement, the progressive movement. And when you see that they pass reform, regardless of whether or not it's for the white government, the perception of the grassroots movement in the status quo passing reform means that the 
collective action increases by 40%. And ultimately, that means more progressive policy in the long term. For these reasons, I see nothing but an affirmative. Okay. that we show in case happened. No, no, I'm just saying there's one example from a motive that some, some Japanese Americans joined the NAACP. And that was the They went to political capital and then went on to pass the Civil Rights Acts of 1990 and 91 no. because they weren't focused on reparations anymore. They was because they weren't focused. That's not what the card They said. also, if you read the other parts of the card, they fought anti-Asian discrimination in the military and anti-Asian violence on the streets, right? Like, that's clearly positive benefits. Okay, we can ask you that because of this that that happened. Regardless, yeah. 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 Yes. Okay, we ask you no okay. okay. When does backlash ever stop social justice? Um, mm -hmm. A really good example of that is the rise of conservatives in the 19, the, the conservatives in the 1970s and Nixon Southern strategy. This is because when yeah. Americans turn, like, after the progressive movement, when Americans yeah. turn against progressivism, so it's desegregation, not one thing, and just not have desegregated. No, but here's the difference, and this is a critical difference. The Civil Rights Act gave Americans rights. They allowed Americans to have better rights in the future. Reparations just give them money. It doesn't give them rights, and that's why the backlash happens. That's, that's, not that's, not what, that's not what the reparations is even about. I think you're really missing the point. We're not advocating, right? We don't care about the amount of money that's given to African Americans. Right? We say you're all of their street cars. Yeah, that's what they are, but that's not what their meaning is. Wait, if that's what they are, then that's what they are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so yes, reparations are physically giving money to someone. You're correct. However, what reparations are really about is taking acknowledgement and accountability for a crime, which is that's why we're saying, which is why we're saying, which, which you can drop in rebuttal says that reparations are prerequisite you to moving can forward as a country. You can read as many cards that claim that reparations are prerequisite as you want, but as long as you don't have the logic, in that no, giving money to someone doesn't bring equality. We've shown you the logic. Show you the logic. Giving it's money doesn't bring equality. It's not about, about giving, giving money. money. That's the entire yeah. point that you're missing. It's, it's about, about taking acknowledgement for a past crime. Okay, great. But why do we have to pay reparations? Why can't you just say sorry? Because, because that's, that's completely like, ineffective. Okay. Like the one time, just, the one time we quote unquote said sorry, the president didn't even sign and the bill. Saying, and it, according to the Atlantic, yeah. it was the equivalent of a congratulatory message saying, for a Super Bowl saying, victory. All we have to do is say sorry, and the result of that is no. no we're we're saying, saying we have to feel so accountability. Yeah. 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 So yeah. yeah. exactly why an ass ballot leads into this instead of like okay. other no, stuff. To me, it seems that we ran into the issue of wealth. We're only going there's to see more facts. There is a large difference between the crime. There is a large difference between the crime. What? Okay, so we're going to move on to the next question. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next Which, according to Trump, is a way that will not benefit African Americans and won't increase perceived efficacy. 
But third, the organization on civil rights that is confederated. See, the media portrays it negatively. The result of neg negative media portrayal, whether it's through violence or just negative portrayal whatsoever, means that, quote, there's a decrease in perceived efficacy. The great example is the Baltimore riots, where you see that things like, uh, you see things like violence are going to be decreasing the perceived efficacy when the media turns against it. But something really important to keep in mind, the Brophy and the Nyhan evidence, it says there's intense backlash and entrenchment of current beliefs. That's really important because they never, ever respond to it. When we pass reparations, Americans only turn more conservative and they go on their beliefs. The 94% of whites don't want reparations, they won't want them anymore. But furthermore, they say that it makes people work harder, they don't give any precedent, so don't buy that response. And they say that like, we're only talking about violence. A, backlash is violent, but B, we're telling the media just turns against it. So here's how it works. In the status quo, we're slowly moving toward progress. When you pass reparations, there is radical redistribution of wealth, and they lose. So ultimately, you see that uh, the, the harm ultimately is, if you pass reparations, you don't get the long-term benefits, and that's ultimately going to be a reason you don't want to pass reparations. I don't say how much